Well, Halcyon Molecular's mission right now is to create the, I guess, most awesome, fastest, cheapest, most accurate high throughput DNA sequencing method available by using electron microscopy. Um, and uh, I work as the director of analysis there, so my task is basically at the very end of the cycle to take the uh, images that were taken with the electron microscopes and to use machine learning and other methods to find sequences of, uh, of bases there, so sequences of the nucleotide bases that tell you what your DNA is or which DNA you've been analyzing. Well, Halcyon is really a tool building company at the moment, so when it comes to discoveries, it's mostly about uh, things that haven't been done before in that area. So for example, we've imaged the, the longest or largest object at the smallest scale, at, so at the highest resolution ever. We have a molecule, at molecular, so at uh, near atomic resolution actually, we've imaged an entire molecule of DNA uh, up to, what was it, something like... It was many microns long, so it was an object that is much larger than anything that's ever been imaged in, like, in electron microscopy before, um, all the way along it. And that was one of those sorts of things. It's the kind of thing that happens almost routinely as you're trying to create something new that's never been done before, and then you have to make a technology that can do that. I was trying to describe what substrate independent minds means and uh, what it means to achieve that objective as well as why you would want to do it and how. Specifically this time I wanted to emphasize that it's a feasible goal and that it is feasible in the near future so it's something that we can actually discuss the solutions for in a manner where you can engineer those solutions. And I presented a number of different uh, solutions there and, and highlighted two of them. that there are a number of different ways you can go when you have really good DNA sequencing, especially when you have high throughput DNA sequencing. Because then you can't only use DNA sequencing as a method of looking at potential problems with DNA, so if you're trying to analyze it and find out if someone might get a certain disease, but you can use it to uh, compare uh, in a large database between many different species and between many individuals of a species and learn things about it, but also you can use it as a tool. You can start using DNA as a way to tag things. You can use it as a barcode, like in that molecular ticker tape thing I was explaining at the, at the talk. Um, and you can use it as, uh, yeah, you can use it as a tool basically to use DNA as part of another operation so that DNA becomes a building block for many other biological tools that you can use. There were other topics that were touched on during the conference that seemed to be somehow particularly interesting or relevant to the people there, such as what different kinds of life extension can you do, or is, is um, AGI dangerous, and how about, uh, say, substrate independent minds, where does it fall on that you know, scale, and these sort of things all came up, but again, you know, it's not necessarily the focus of what substrate independent minds would be about but that was kind of what the conference seemed to focus on. So. But there's also the element of being the first time that this was done here in Asia, and that most people were not really exposed to things like substrate independent mines or AGI or life extension before in that form. It's interesting that, uh, to, to look at it from the point of view of how many different routes are there actually to strive for some kind of extension or expansion of life that is based on a technological understanding of what we can do about the mechanisms that we're really based on. Because when you take it that way, instead of something spiritual like trying to live on through your children or trying to live on through your memories that you write down or something like this, there are basically four routes that, that you end up discussing. And one of them, this happens to be something we talked about recently among friends, one of them is this idea that you keep your biology in, in place and you keep rejuvenating it, keep fixing it so that it stays exactly as it is. You fix damage, get rid of garbage, and you also have to take care that your environment stays approximately the same so that your body is well suited to live in it. So you need to have that, nothing weird happens to the climate, to the earth, to, you know, if you go to the moon, you bring your own climate with you because it all has to stay the same, pretty much. The other one is the idea of building replacement parts. So if something fails, you build a replacement part. And I know a company that is working on building these kinds of replacement parts, and right now they're building replacement blood using stem cells. So stem cells is the, the concept there for, for building new replacement pieces for everything that could possibly break down.
Well, the idea there is that if you can bring down, let's say, bring a person down to minus 36 degrees Celsius or lower, if you can get lower, it's a kind of cryonics related approach, and put someone who is still alive in stasis that way, then you could keep them fairly unchanged for, say, up to six months, then have them reappear for about two days or so to reinvigorate them, get their health back up to shape, uh, check out what's happened since then, read the newspapers, find out if life extension has been achieved, and then if necessary go back under for another six months and keep hopping forward in that manner. So that would be jumping forward in time as a means of life extension. Actually, the idea of that, that jumping forward in time, I think that's been around for quite a long time in the cryonics community. This is the six month hopping thing is just something that uh, Michael Andrag and I came up with while discussing how difficult it was to do cryonics at really low temperatures and that it may be easier at some of the less low temperatures like that minus 36 degrees point. So at that level you can't keep someone under for thousands of years but you can still keep them under for a short period of time. It's sort of like how we bring people down to low body temperatures right now in order to stop their heart and stop every, all the activity there to do critical surgery on them and then bring them back up to a higher temperature. It's a pretty normal procedure these days. Yeah. Well, through nanotechnology, if we had nanotechnology, not a bad idea. Other methods I could imagine as well. The problem is if you want to do that sort of replacement, you really need to be able to record what's going on at that time and implement the replacement in that same fashion. You can't just put an arbitrary generic neuron connected in whichever way in place of an existing neuron with its connections that have been learned. If you do that, you need to give the individual neuron time to be absorbed into an existing network because we know neural networks are robust but you can't just do that for millions of neurons at once or else the robustness is gone. So in that case, if you had to do it one by one, very gradually, then it would take forever to do that for 100 billion neurons. So in the case of just putting any old new neuron in place of an old neuron, I find that very difficult to see how you could do that. But in a technological approach where you record what the neuron is doing and replace its function at the same time, yes, of course, that's, that's a very good way of going forward. Um, if we're smart and we really adapt ourselves to where we're trying to live, then that's not going to be the point at all. I mean, you see all these pictures of giant spaceships with, uh, that are supposed to house hundreds of people and take them somewhere over hundreds of years or thousands of years, and, uh, you know, cityscapes and all this stuff. But it doesn't really make very much sense if you can exist in multiple places at the same time by basically having a mind that can exist in various substrates, that can live as a spaceship in space, that could be a swarm of robots, that could, you know, do all sorts of things that you just can't do as a body that needs a house, that needs a box that you live in, a bed that you sleep in and all that. So I think the pictures that we have of the future are probably just as wrong as the 1960s version of the flying car that you imagined we were going to have. I think that most likely it would just be an expanding sort of sphere of computation material in which you can house multiple different minds that are sharing computational resources in sort of a marketplace, I guess, of computation. It's a really good a marketplace of computation. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that we uh, share resources right now and uh, sort of have a system of exchange in a way, you know, we're always giving someone something for something in return. I don't see any reason why you can't have something similar for computation, just like we do now for computation on the Amazon cloud. So you asked me, what does transhumanism mean to me? Transhumanism, at least the way I was exposed to it, means to me largely a group of people uh, that's it, a community, a group of people who are open-minded and willing to talk about technology as something that's progressive, something that could advance us, 
rather than just be you know, a problem. And so it's a place where you can experiment with ideas and where you can bring out new ideas and discuss them before, uh, before implementing. And I, I think, as a sense, yeah, I found that they've been very receptive to many things. And yes, that includes everything from life extension to artificial intelligence to uh, ways that we could be living in the future. But yeah, it's mostly about the community. I've discussed this with other people uh, about a year ago or so. Uh, what we often bandied about was this concept of a second enlightenment, a sort of second renaissance, when people come up with a new way of thinking about things and about life and about people and where do we stand, what's our place in the universe, all this sort of stuff. Well, we do have a lot of luxury of, to think about stuff like that right now, which is one of the things I actually worry about, which is, you know, we think about things like the singularity, for example, whether or not that happens in the way that people think. But all of that sort of technological progress depends on this society with, with all of its capabilities, its, its infrastructure, its ability to make things happen existing. And if, if that you know, doesn't work anymore, if there's an economic breakdown, if, uh, you can no longer simply get people that have certain skills to work together and have the resources that they need and plan things and work in a place where there's a certain amount of security, then it becomes really hard to have, uh, have the kind of future and possibilities that we've got right now. So yeah, it's, it's a luxury to be able to do that.